Hello, my beautiful people. I am so excited to have you here. So if you watched the last video, which I hope you do, it was my daughter teaching maximum likelihood. Now let me tell you a little bit about the story behind that because <laughs> it'll explain a little bit about the video. So my daughter and I were hanging out and she really, really wanted to make a video together. And I was kind of busy making YouTube videos. She's like, hey dad, why don't you put me in your YouTube video? And I said, okay. And then she said, as she is want to do, can we do it now? 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 And I said, you know what? Why not? Let's do it. So without any planning whatsoever, I guided my daughter through teaching about maximum likelihood. Um, after the fact, I realized it was pretty freaking hilarious and amazing and super cute, but maybe not so easy to understand. And by the way, um, YouTube, apparently I learned this, automatically prevents comments if it detects there are children in the video and you have to manually turn that off. And so there were no comments on the video for like a week. And I said, this is unusual. Usually I get comments by now. Sure enough, they had been turned off. And unfortunately, most of my comments come within the first week of the video. And my daughter kept asking me, what are people saying? What are people saying? I'm like, they're not saying anything. And so, um, yeah, if you wanted to make a comment in the last video and didn't get a chance, you should be able to now. My daughter would appreciate it. Anyway, let me review the idea of optimization real quick. So very often in statistics, we have solutions to problems that can't be found with just a simple equation. Instead, what we end up doing is we have the algorithm search for the solution. And to do that, we give it a possible criteria. So in the last video that my daughter did, we talked about the residuals. So maybe we want to make the residuals as small as possible. And so to do that, we set a criteria in the form of a function that might look something like this. Sum of x minus x bar squared, which is the sum of the squared residuals. And so you plug that into the algorithm and say, all right, come up with different values for x bar or the come up with different values for the mean and try to figure out which one of those values gives us the smallest of this equation, which is the sum of the squared residuals. And so what the algorithm will do is it will adjust the parameters. In this case, x bar, or I also talked about in the last video, the slope and the intercept, and it will adjust those parameters. And if when it makes an adjustment, the criteria improves, or in the case of the residuals, the residuals get smaller, then it will keep making similar adjustments like that. And it will keep making these adjustments until it can no longer improve, in which case we say the algorithm has converged. And also let me review some terminology, just in case you missed it from the last video. One, loss function. So a loss function is the criteria we use. So in this example, we talked about x minus x bar squared. Starting parameters. Starting parameters are the initial guesses that the algorithm gives. I think in the last video with my daughter, we said, all right, maybe the mean is four, or it could be five, or it could be 10, or it could be a thousand, whatever. The algorithm is always gonna start with a random value. And that's what we call the starting parameter. Or starting parameters if it's trying to find multiple parameters. And then convergence is when the algorithm can no longer improve. And non-convergence is when the algorithm can't find a minimum or a maximum. And we use a figure that looks like this, where the optimal solution is actually a band of values or a range of values. Or another situation you might run into is that the algorithm makes a move in a direction, the fit gets better, and it makes another move in that direction, the fit gets better, and it just keeps improving, 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 and never stops improving. The computer can't run forever, so eventually it's just gonna quit and say, hey, it keeps improving, I don't know what to do. It's just not gonna converge. So that's what uh, my daughter talked about in the last video, and I'll leave a link in the description and in one of those cards if you haven't seen it, because it really is super cute. I'm so proud of her. Now I'm going to move on to probability density functions. Yeah. That's kind of a weird thing to talk about. You remember probability density functions? Why am I talking about those now? I don't know. Actually, I do know. Um, it's kind of important. So just as a reminder, a probability density function is a mathematical equation that gives you the probability of each and every possible score. Except I just lied to you. It actually doesn't give you a probability. It gives you a likelihood. And I don't know that that's necessarily important for this video, but I'm going to say it because if I don't say it, some statistician's going to be pedantic and call me out in the comments and tell me I don't know what I'm doing and it hurts my feelings. I'd rather not have my feelings hurt, so let's just talk about it now. So if you have a continuous distribution, meaning that there are an infinite number of possible values, like you could have a 2.347875438892, and the probability of any two people having exactly the same score, if you go enough decimal places, is zero. And so for continuous distributions, theoretically, the probability of a specific score is zero. So it doesn't really make sense to talk about probabilities unless you're talking about a range. So you can compute, like, for example, in this plot, what is the probability of having a score that falls within 
the range of this value and this value. That we can do, but we can't compute the probability of a single score. Instead, what we do is we compute what's called the density or the likelihood. So in this plot, the y-axis, the height of that curve is actually a likelihood or a density. So when we use the term probability density function, ha, look at that. The word density is in the probability density function. So the probability density function gives you the density or the likelihood of any given score. So what is a likelihood and what is a density? Just think of it as like the concentration of scores around that specific value. That's all it is. And so if we were talking about a normal distribution, which is one of the most common distributions we use in statistics, the probability density function looks like this. And that is super scary. Like even to me, scary. Ah, scary. You don't have to memorize that. You don't have to know that. I'm just showing you um, just to show off that I know the probability density function of the normal distribution, but that's what it is. So let me just run through an example real quick. Let's say that we have a distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Let's say that Shaquille has a score of 1.3 on whatever scale this is. So if we were to plug that into our probability density function, we would get this equation. I'm not gonna say it because it's really long. Notice that we replace that mu with a zero and we replace that X with 1.3, which is Shaquille's score. And we've replaced sigma squared with a one. And so if we were to do that, we would get a score of 0.171. That is the density, or that is the likelihood. And if we were to plot that on a graph, that line right there shows you the height of the probability density function at a score of x equals 1.7. Or in other words, the density or the likelihood of uh, Shaquille's score is 1.7. He likes to go by Shaq, by the way. All right. So um, that is a review of probability density functions. You're probably like wondering like, hey, dude, why are we talking about probability density functions? We're just talking about optimization algorithms. And now you went on this weird tangent about probability density functions. Well, guess what? There is a method to my madness, people. Just chill, be patient and stuff. So let's go back to the tennis analogy that my daughter used. Again, if you haven't seen that video, I'll link it. And as she mentioned, we want to know the best place to stand in a tennis match. And before what we did was we computed running distances. Here's the graphic again, in case you missed it. Now what we can do instead of using the running distances like we did before, we can instead use the likelihood function. So now we have a table that looks like this, assuming that our guess of the mean is four or our guess of the best place to stand for the tennis match is four. For the ball that lands at location 11, if our guess was four, we would have to run seven feet or we can compute the likelihood as 0.96706, et cetera. And for the ball that falls at location nine, we would have to run five feet using our old metric, but using the likelihood, we can compute it as 0.9055, et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera. And then before, what we did was we summed up the distances as our loss function. But this time, instead of doing that, we're gonna do something with the likelihood, but instead of summing up the likelihoods, what we actually do is we multiply them. So we would get 0.9670658 times 0.9055430 times this, times this, times this, et cetera. And if we were to multiply all those densities or all those likelihoods together, we would get a value of 1.1895369 with four, with the decimal place moved over four zeros. So basically a very, very small number. So yeah, that's a really small number and probability. And that happens a lot when you're multiplying densities or likelihoods because they tend to be small values. Now this represents a problem for computers because computers have very limited precision. Basically, there's a certain point that a computer reaches that it's like that number's too small. I'm not even gonna worry about it. I think it only allows precision up to 255 digits past zero. So if you got a value that is 0.0000, 255 times, and then whatever after that, um, computer, anything after 255, the computer doesn't worry about anymore. So that's a problem for computers. So what we end up doing is we end up doing the log of the likelihood. And for those who are mathematically savvy and remember calculus, I guess it would be. I think that's where it's usually taught. When you're taking the log of a product, you can instead sum up the logs. So that's what ends up happening. But mathematical details you don't have to care about. So if we were to plot that likelihood function or that log likelihood function now, we would get something that looks like this where we have on the x-axis the proposed value and on the y-axis the log likelihood. And we see that around that value, we get the maximum of the log likelihood. Guess what that is? That is the maximum likelihood answer. So let me just summarize what I just said. We're trying to figure out what the best value of the mean is or a regression line or whatever. 
And one strategy to do that, particularly with complex problems, is to use an optimization algorithm. And what optimization algorithms do is instead of computing the right solution, instead they propose solutions and then compute how bad that answer is and then make an adjustment and then compute how bad the new number is and then keep doing that until they get the least bad solution. And the first way we talked about to define good versus bad solutions is the residuals and minimizing the size of the residuals. Another criteria we could use instead of minimizing the sum of the residuals is we could maximize the log of the likelihood. And the reason why it's called maximum likelihood instead of minimum likelihood is because we're talking about a likelihood. We wanna see a high likelihood of obtaining our scores given the parameters of our model. So you're probably asking yourselves like, man, yeah, that's cool and stuff, but the problem is like, why, why do you gotta make it so complicated, man? Why you gotta make it so complicated? It was so much easier to compute the deviations from the residuals. I mean, this is the simple equation we had before. X minus X bar squared. A little bit of math, but not too scary. Why do we have to go and introduce this probability density function with this like super complicated formula? Yeah, it was so much easier before. I totally agree with you. But there's a very good reason why we use maximum likelihood. We use it because it is tied to the probability density function. When we use our probability density function for optimization, we can then use that probability density function to make inferences. For example, we can compute p-values or we can compute confidence intervals. That's why you hear about maximum likelihood so much in statistics. Because if you are to invent a new statistical procedure, one of your primary goals is probably going to be to find a maximum likelihood loss function. Why? Because if you find a maximum likelihood solution that is tied to the probability density function, then you can make inferences and you get your p-values and your confidence intervals. So that's kind of a big deal. So that's the basic idea behind maximum likelihood. We've got a solution that we can't really compute. Instead, we ask the computer to try to find the solution. And it starts it with some random starting parameters, inputs the likelihood function, computes its log likelihood, and then adjusts the parameters repeatedly until it finds that maximum of the likelihood function, or technically the maximum of the log likelihood function. So that's all there is to maximum likelihood. That's pretty easy, right? No, it's not. <laughs> I get it. This is one of those topics that's actually kind of difficult to conceptualize. Um, if you're struggling, of course, uh, post a question down below and I'm happy to answer it. But I'd also recommend watching this video a couple times. Maybe you'll get it. Hopefully. By the way, something pretty exciting is happening. Um, yeah, yours truly, me, the Dustin man, I'm going to be teaching a live class in August on mixed models. And this video that you're watching is part of that series. So if you want the opportunity to ask me questions, especially about maximum likelihood, hey, sign up, register for the class. I'd love to see you there. Leave the link in the description for simplistics.net where you can sign up. Really hope to see you there because it'd be fun. So yeah, with that, let's go ahead and review our learning objectives. And by the way, these cover the last video and this video. One, why do we need optimization algorithms? Because some statistical methods are so complex, they don't have a simple solution for the answer. Instead, you have to ask the computer to find you the solution. Number two, understand the basics of how optimization algorithms work. Again, what they do is they put random values in for the starting parameters, compute the loss function, and then make small adjustments. And if those small adjustments improve, they keep going in that direction until eventually they can no longer improve the solution. Loss functions. Uh, yeah, loss functions are the equations we use to, they are the criteria we use to, that we want to minimize or maximize. And then make sure you understand starting parameters and convergence and non-convergence. Also understand the relationship between probability density functions, maximum likelihood, and optimization. And again, one optimization loss criteria is maximum likelihood, which ties the optimization algorithm to a probability density function, which then allows us to make inferences, which is pretty cool and also understand the difference between likelihood and probability. And also make sure you understand why maximum likelihood solutions are desirable, which is really what I just said a little bit ago. They're desirable because once you tie it to a probability density function, then you're able to make inferences. So yeah, that's all I gotta say right now. Until next time, peace out.